And final, the Kansai 2019, and uh, we have Manbiki Takashi on the government. <laughs> and Love Sexy on the opposition. <laughs> Chair is me, and panel Motoki-san, Koba-san, Kun-kun, Mitsuko-san. And the motion for this round is this house believes that social media is ruining democracy. I'd like to call upon Prime Minister to open your case within seven minutes. Here, here. In the emergence of social media, we are moving forward post through society, as we already, we already recognize. Among the lot of information we receive every day, every morning, every night, some information is trustable, some information is actually truth. But other information, a lot of information, is fake information, manipulated information, that prevent people from being informed of what the current world looks like correctly. Information is a core source, of, uh, core source in, in order for democracy to function correctly, that's why we can say social media, which is damaging the function to inform citizens, is ruining democracy. From Prime Minister, I want to talk about three things. First of all, what's the definition of functional democracy? And I want to set up this debate, what our democracy should be defined. And secondly, I want to talk about what do we, do we mean by good democracy. In this, um, in this, um, in this point, I want to talk about what uh, what what we are proof we are having and what what we are what we are, we are calling good democracy. And lastly, I want to talk about how does social media ruin the democracy we define. And also, I want to talk about how at least that uh, the world without social media is less ruined uh, in our cyber house. So first of all, what's the definition of functional democracy? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the well functioned democracy, people can reflect their interests or their opinions in the politics based on the proper understanding of what's going on in the world, how a policy affects their life, and what kind of politicians will affect their life in, in what way. The way to reflect um, to the, the politics can be different from one type of to, uh, um, democracy to another type of democracy. A direct democracy is fine, indirect democracy is fine. But the thing is, people must be informed of the fact to grasp the proper situation of society. Based on that, people can make a um, rational decision what kind of positions are best um, based, in the, uh, best, um, fitting your interest. That kind of decision can be only happening when people can be uh, correctly informed. And also, we will, say, we will say, they may say they will also like to express what opinions, and maybe social media will address that. But we say that we need to prioritize the right to be informed over the right to express your opinion freely, maybe in social media. Why is that? First of all, meaningful discussion and meaningful expression by individuals are based on the proper information that individuals uh, are receiving before expressing their opinions. If you are arguing on the, uh, the wrong fact or the wrong data, that discussion can be never meaningful, Miss ladies and gentlemen. That's why um, the meaningful expression should be based on proper information. And secondly, even though in some discussion, some information is actually truth, if people doubt that, maybe this information is wrong. Maybe Maybe this information is suspicious, suspicious, people can believe that this discussion is probably going, and in that case, discussion doesn't progress. Conclusion here is the right to express opinions to the public might be important, maybe it's important, but the right to be correctly informed uh, by the media uh, from the public is more, more important and a priority we need to protect. So let's move on to um, the second point about what we mean by doing democracy, but before that, yes. Can you prove to us that conventional media will never provide false news in the first place? Yeah, I will talk that. I will talk about that in second argument and third argument. So, first of all, so it's not the burden proof of our side of the house to prove democracy without social media is not ruined at all as a motion is. Social media is ruining democracy. I guess other trends or other functions or other phenomena also ruin democracy to some extent. Maybe some media is very bad for democracy. Um, some people are very bad for democracy. Trump is bad for democracy. But we, we don't deny that. But we say um, democracy is actually ruining democracy. And we believe that, that while we saw democracy is less ruined in terms of democracy, that's a burden proof of our side of the house. 
Um, then, well, what do you mean by doing democracy is that uh, information for the individuals are not correctly provided to individuals. That's the bottom proof of our side of the So, let's talk about more practical details. How, details, how does social media do democracy as we define it? So, in social media, as I did touch in the introduction, there are a lot of information which people are saying that are not account accountable for. People tweeting in the Twitter are not account accountable for information. People can tweet whatever you want. In the Facebook, you can say without any background data that some people just receive that as a fact or as an actual um, thing I'm going, going, going in the society. Fake news is overflowing SNS, even though it's not fake by itself. People who secondly share the fact or people who secondly retweet the news are uh, different interpretations in, in the way that the actual first author are not imagine it. So in those circumstances, the decision for politics, decision in democracy is actually good. For example, in the presidential election between Trump and versus Hillary, there are a lot of gossip of Hillary. Maybe some of the gossip about Hillary was true, but some of them were not actually true. Based on that information, a lot of, a lot of people are running away from Hillary and going to vote Trump. If that information is really wrong, that is not, uh, we can say, uh, we cannot say that election is really correct. Also, in terms of Brexit, some supporters of Brexit post a random fake uh, statistics to prove that Brexit is better for Black, um, uh, for, Brit, um, e, um, for UK. That kind of, of uh, fake news is actually ruining the democracy. We cannot call that decision is a, as a rational decision made by individuals. So why our side of the house is actually better? We say that well, without demo, uh, well, I'm sorry, the well, without social media, we will be at least less ruined. So maybe they said that like, all the media, like news, um, mass media, TV, radio, newspaper, uh, uh, are also bad. But at least we say all that kind of media are more accountable for information they provide for the public. Why is that? First of all, sponsors pay for the media. Sub subscribers pay for it. We are paying money for the leading newspapers in those cases. In that case, those social media, I'm sorry, those old media broadcast, if all that kind of media broadcast wrong information, they are strongly criticized by the public. Senior management need to resign in some context. Their mechanism to make media more accountable compared to social media in which they cannot be responsible, they cannot be accountable for the contents that they are broadcasting to the public. And also, more importantly, um, when comparing our world and their world, the more important thing is, in our world, the old media can be more alive in the outside of the house. Because as you recognize the fact, after, after social media was in mind of the public, the, old, the necessity of old media perceived by the public is decreasing. And actually, many uh, newspaper companies are, are bank flap, bank flap, and TV is on, at this point, and uh, is less sub subscribed and was in a society. So, um, uh, in conclusion, we believe all media are more accountable, but because of the existence of social media, that kind of media have less co um, less coverage or um, less how to say less people are watching it. That is very problematic to um, make a democracy functional. Uh, for all those reasons, we are very proud to propose. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to call upon leader of opposition to open your case within seven minutes. Be here. Social media is just more than being a Wikipedia that's accessible to people. It's also about 
giving people, minorities, people who have lesser voices in our society, the ability to be able to voice out and to be able to show their political identity to individuals so that in instances where they are misrepresented by their governments, for example, or in instances where they are censored within their countries, they literally have the capability to be able to garner that very political will in order for them to be able to change those instances. We think that government misses this debate when they forget to talk about how minorities under their side of the house, or more of like minorities without the existence of social media, will be able to enhance themselves but moreover to be able to achieve the kind of social movements that we have right now. So simple rebuttals to the previous speaker because most of the things that he was saying are highly conceivable. So I agree to him when he's talking about like how democracy must function in a way that people need to have informed choices and we agree to that and we think that social media also is in tandem with that very goal and I'm going to prove that to you in my case. Moreover we say is that what we think he misses in today's debate is the aspect of how it allows individuals to be able to own a political agency. So in that aspect I have several rebuttals to the previous speaker before I move on to my case. First, let's talk about why we think that most of the examples that they talk about, that, like things like fake news, things like, for example, like the fake statistics apparently from Brexit are, are all things that are like highly just mis misrepresented by their side. So when he's talking about like things like fake statistics for Brexit, um, those were statistics that came out from economists and I think they just made a mistake based on the capacity of how they understood the information that was disclosed by the government at that point of time. Which means that the truth that they are talking about on the other side is highly subjective to things that are already provided by our government. So at that we don't really see that, that that is a problem of social media per se, but it is a problem of like misdisclosure of information coming from the actual government themselves. Which means they highly missed the problem at that. Next, they're talking about investors crowning out the interests of like social media and becoming liberal, right? We don't think this is true. This is true. It's because like a lot of the investors of social media right now, for example, Facebook and Twitter, are like all individuals who have a plethora of backgrounds and political ideologies, right? So at that point, when you have a plethora of ideas and political ide ideologies all funding one corporation, you do not really get just one form of dominated form of a political ideology being forwarded within things like, for example, social network websites, but you have them all balanced out precisely because of the fact that you have different interests that you all need to balance out within, like, for example, the board of that very specific corporation. So we do not really think that that is true they're talking about. So what are the things that I'm going to fight for in today's debate? I'm going to fight for three things. One, uh, three, three things, right? First, I'm going to prove to you how, my, how minorities can voice out. This is for four reasons. The first one that I want to talk about is because of the fact of the mechanism of social media, you allow individuals who are not covered by news news networks, for example, like BBC, for, for example, like CNN, to be able to have a voice in, this, in these platforms. How do you do that, right? It's because of the functions of social media itself. When individuals, for example, see a specific issue, like for example, hashtag me to being shared within the internet, you allow individuals the capability to be able to like those things. You allow individuals the capability capability to be able to share their, share those things. Moreover, you allow individuals the identity, the, 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 the ability to be able to use things like, for example, hashtags in order to make and allow individuals to be able to touch that information precisely because of the fact that you want individuals to be able to view most of those things. And when individuals find, your, find, find the kind of things that you're talking about very interesting, individuals have the incentive to like those things, to share those things to, the, to their friends, and all, those, and all those kind of things, right? So you make it, so you make these various uh, issues, like things like, for example, sexual harassments that are usually not covered, especially when they're done to people like, for example, Kavanaugh, to be able to be exposed within the social network services before BBC, for example, or other news networks can actually talk to them, right? And this is very important. It's precisely because of the fact that you're talking about individuals who are most likely dismissed within our society. When you're talking about, for example, like LGBT individuals also being sexually harassed and the kind of da damages that are done to these individuals, there is less incentive for conventional media to actually want to cover these individuals, right? So in that sense, we think that it becomes easier when you're actually using social media to be able to use those kind of to be to be able to broadcast those kind of informations, right? And the example that we can see that this was most effective was when individuals were using the hashtag called Black Lives Matter, right? In this very specific instance, when Black Lives were being ignored, being neglected in America, America did not want those views to be actually broadcasted out. In fact, they were actually like propagating to news medias to not proactively cover things like, for example, police brutality at that point. But it was because of the fact that social media existed and it allowed individuals to be able to share images, vivid images of things like, for example, police brutality it made it visible for everyone to be able to understand that black individuals in Missouri were actually being shut down and being harmed by the police officers that were in those vicinities, right? So we think at that, it is very important for these individuals to have been able to use that. We think that's something that they're not going to be able to have under their side of the house. But the second reason is because there is no barrier in participation, right? Because when you're talking about social network services, unlike things like, for example, when you need to discuss with other individuals, like using like very specific terminologies, like if, if you have to discuss something, for example, in 
status quo, you have to go to places like, for example, universities. You have to go to places that are very formal, that are controlled by governmental institutions, right? So in those instances, it becomes harder for you to actually access them because number one, some individuals who are poor, for example, might not have like like the necessary attire, for example, or the necessary money to have been able to enter those kind of areas. So in those instances, they're literally blocked out from that very participation. What about social media? What social media does is that, no thank you, an avenue that provides literally like free access to every single individual. Because of the fact that social news outlets, or for example, social medias, are collecting things like, for example, data, and they get profits from that. So they have every incentive to actually distribute that to every single individual. So it is actually something that is much more effective and something that's actually freely distributed to every single indi individuals, right? But lastly, and more importantly, we think that this contributes to the collection of individuals being able to form like things like, for example, political riots, right? And this is something that's very important. It's because we've seen this in Tunisia, right? The reason why democracy was accessible in Tunisia is precisely because of, a, of the fact that people were able to share in secret things like, for example, the political oppressions that were being done to them by the actual government, right? And because of things like, for example, censorship existing within the actual Tunisian internet, individuals were, were able to circumvent that by using things like, for example, VPN and accessing Twitter and actually talking and collectivizing with other individuals, right? Sure. So as much as these people are able to voice out themselves, their opponents are also able to counter that and mislabel that and represent them in discriminatory ways. Why is that necessary that you're able to voice out and empower these people? Because if you voice out, you get like more people to be able to support you, right? Like literally, if people are being shot dead in Tunisia, it's not just the Tunisian majority being able to view all of those, all, all, all of those kind of things, but it's, it's the bigger like picture of the global being able to view those kind of things, right? So like human rights um, activists are able to see them and are able to spread them to in order to like collectivize and lobby to their own governments so that their governments will actually have an incentive to actually do something. Next, I want to talk about diversification of information, right? Because under their side of the house, big corporations dominates. They also agree with that. But big corporations are prone to censorships, right? So like, for example, when big corporations are only like given subsidy by their own their own countries, like for example, BBC in England, it, they're more prone to liberal biases at that point. So you don't really get like the symmetry of like political information at that point. Lastly, let's talk about like people being able to discuss within the social ne network platforms. This is where I engage with their fake news. Because they said fake news is something that's problematic. Yeah, I understand. But number one, Facebook is doing things to be able to circumvent that. They have fact checks already existing as a community. But secondly, when people are able to find out that those news are fakes, they can literally comment on those news and tell people that they are fake and actually link them to the actual real reality, right? So if they wanted to talk about real, real, real reality, we are much more accessible on the art side of the house because of the fact that social media exists, right? So in every single criterion that they provided into DCB, we've proven to you how social media Number one, contributes to that, but secondly, actually enhances all of those kind of things. And for that reason, do not vote for government. Thank you. Thank you for the mark. Next, I'd like to call upon Deputy Prime Minister. Here, here. The second number two, that's bias spreading, that's a fake news that if you want to that saying that's truth as a right, just so you can easily to say you are right up discussing, easy to say any evidence that any news resource is recognizing that's a fake one. Or just you're spreading that false information that just you making that false evidence and not call it just truth because there's a random economy support it, random scholar support it, these kind of things. No, actually, that problem is on that government side is that, that this uh, spreading of the social thing is that uh, ruin that uh, every individual the capability to check whether or not this information is a viable or not because damage to that old fashioned media. The first of all, we say that's easy to spread in fake news. So that's why I still be preferring that uh, <coughs> that's, uh, the more that helps your democracy, that you can rely on that uh, particular information but, uh, or that you can that's accept in that diversity of opinion. But unfortunately, that opponents have never explained to you that what exact the meaning of the ruined democracy and healthy democracy, just spreading the random benefit and also some, yes, these kind of things. So, the from that, that 
to that main crash from the, the DPT prime minister. First of all, that's a bit, why that's a splitting and the existence of the social networking service that actually ruined the checking system or that's whether or not the disinformation is as correct or not. And uh, secondly, that's the, why that's a by, that's the, from the perspective of the people's mindset, the why that's actually the people do not have accepting that the opponent's idea that actually rejected its significant problematic perspective or the diversity of the democracy. So all my reputation included in my speech. Move on to the first issue. How does the chicken branch system is a ruin? Before we go, yes. Um, in status quo, I could also publish a book denying the Holocaust. How can you like verify that? Moreover, how is that a reason? Because it exists in social media platforms, it becomes a reason that it makes democracy regress. Okay, we never say that uh, social network service, service is that uh, absolutely that's con the absolute evil, and I don't know that's uh, completely constructing such kind of idea. Just what I want to say is that this is the existence of social network service, the accelerating that's uh, this kind of uh, bad subject of fake news, etc. We do not necessarily do that supporting that uh, I don't know perfect uh, society, etc. Anyway, move on to the first issue about how it's green that check and balance system. So, as my partner already mentioned, that the, st the splitting that the bad statistics is uh, actually the existence and also it's damage to the people's mindset. So, why it's actually that split it in the current social networking service that? So, because first of all, that it's ruined that's all the, the old media's capability to check and balance system, uh, check out that whether or not this is a fact or not. Because, that's, uh, because it's splitting that uh, many people seeing the social network services as a uh, core resource, the core source of that uh, news. That's on that occasion, that unfortunately, that still someone that to, that stop to that uh, watching that uh, TV show or the buying that uh, newspaper. The actual is that the people cannot, uh, cannot, that, uh, okay, the company cannot sustain that their own uh, the management. So that's why they cannot using the, so much money to the, uh, the, the searching about the particular information or, not, or checking about the whether or not this information is correct or not. So. Uh, first of all, uh, second result. <coughs> so, but, but, okay, that. So, that's why you say that. They, um, <coughs> that's, that no one can check it. That. So, first of all, that they talking about that, for example, that's break, the stake so that Brexit is also the supported by that, the, some economists, etc. So, it's also that, the, because just economy support something doesn't necessarily mean that it's a variable one. Because that's once spreading in that, that this and then the economists support it, that actually that every individual do not have that any that's idea about that whether or not this the economist is that's the, the uh, credible the person or not. So so on that occasion that that, that they can uh, in the apparent social network services that rather than really that this system. <laughs> okay, sorry. So okay, that why that's uh, all the media is that necessary. So, because in a paradigm, that the, the media also does constrain about that also check out that whether or not this information is correct or not, and also that's actually showing that the evidence, and also that the uh, actually that talk with us, also that uh, okay, sorry, <laughs> okay. So let's discuss this. Um, actually, check that. So that's why you think that. Um, the old media do not have capable to check and also spreading things. So in the on that occasion, that just as random as fake news, the spread it in society. So okay, that's also they talking about that. Um, right. Uh, okay, let's move on to the se second issue about that. Why the people do not accepting that uh, opponent's idea. So the in their paradigm that the people do not just as uh, the watching that's the uh, news media, it's rather just uh, that's believing that's a random idea of that's a uh, politician, the random idea of the particular scholar. That's because that's that as a nature of the social networking services that the more that's uh, radical or the more that's easy to understandable one is that's uh, retweeted and all that's uh, shared in that uh, Facebook and uh, the social uh, the Twitter discussion. It's always happened. So that's why that once the uh, Trump easy to say that the BBC tell the right, or that sometimes that's uh, the Fox News is a bad, sure. say, bad thing, so that people unfortunately that's uh, retweeted. So it's a significantly <coughs> the, the problematic because the people do not understand the whether or not the particular news media is a correctable or not. The, when that the people try to consider about the BC, BBC is a uh, reliable or not reliable, that's a day that can search in the Twitter or the Facebook, and actually that, that kind of place is uh, actually spreading the fake news. That no one can understand anything that uh, whether or not the disinformation is correct or not. Sir. Uh, no, thank you. <coughs> so, <coughs> oh, uh, Okay, that's so. That, that's why that's the, the people also just uh, stick to that uh, radical idea. Also, that they, they cannot uh, think uh, things uh, understanding that. 
So that's why that people easy to sway by that uh, false statics or the, by that, for example, that Brexit case. That because of people thinking that, that maybe that's even this is a, like, like a fake news, maybe that's a, this tweet says that economists say this is a correct idea, these kind of things. So, or just even that's, uh, for example, that's uh, just a uh, leader opposition say that so can someone can reveal the particular information. That information is uncomfortable for you. That's easy to say. Even if it reveals information, this information is a lie. So actually, no one can understand what the information is true. The what the information is a lie. So that's why they they just have to stick to that their ideology. They can just rely on that the the people who can are using that rely on. So what I told you from that deputy prime minister. So. <coughs> First of all, that's that because of the that decline of that's the old fashioned media, that actually that's no one can check out that whether or not this information is correct or not. The second is that because also the people that mindset it's changed. If they cannot understand what their truth or right, they can just stick and also they do not accept that's another one's idea. For all those reasons we propose. Thank you. Thank you for the mark. Next, I'd like to call upon Deputy Leader of Opposition, here. Thank you. When televisions were invented and when news outlets started to broadcast their news on television station, people oftentimes said that that would ruin democracy because unlike paper journalism, it will make news an entertainment. Obviously, we all know that that is not true. We think that all the harms that the affirmative team has so far been talking about is only a, like a temporary harm during the transition period. So we don't, want, we don't believe that the potential harm that they were talking about is like a fundamental and core like, characteristic of social network in the context of democracy. We believe that social media is an important platform in, uh, to accelerate inclusive participation of both majority and minority. Before I move on to my uh, argumentation, one independent response to the previous speaker. So he basically talked about how social media could be an eco chamber, eco chamber and how that could radicalize certain opinion and how that is bad. We think that that analysis also applies to conventional media as well, because people who are like deeply conservative probably only watch Fox television, like right? But the unique difference in social media is that if you disagree with the opinion or the news provided by Fox media, you can directly retweet against it and like respond to that and give a counter opinion. And that's, that is how you initiate this particular discourse. The unique point about social network is that like, not all, but like certain social network provide anonymity. And we, th we think that this is a very unique and important characteristic. Because as a consequence of being anonymous, like in the real world, it's very difficult for you to go against a professor, an economical professor of Oxford. But like in an, an, an anonymous like uh, dis discourse platform, you don't really have to like consider that. You don't, you don't really have to be worried about that you're an average show countering against a professor from Oxford. So we believe that this like um, uh, inclusive platform is an essential part to facilitate democratic discourse. So moving to the second issue, which is the issue of fake news given by today's affirmative team. So what we heard from the Prime Minister onward was that incorrect information, aka fake news, are rampant in social media and people are making wrong political decisions. Now first of all, like at the same, we accept that there are like incorrect information, but at the same time, we have to also acknowledge that there's a lot of correct information at the same time. And it's not just an average layman like me who's tweeting on tweet, uh, Twitter, right? Like tweet that gets the most attention and probably the most like retweet are probably tweet which are more informationally correct and accurate, uh, like information provided by scholars or university professor or scientists, right? But second of all, conventional media also like post like news on these kind of social networks. So we think that the, the, the 
potential uh, benefit of correct information of conventional media also applies in social media as well, because it has a consequence of advent of things such as curation media. But moreover, like the ultimate harm that they gave us was that this social media led to like Hillary losing and Trump winning and Brexit, right? Like they can't like you can consider that as the ultimate harm in today's debate because we don't know whether Brexit or Hillary losing is a harm to democracy. So you can't just il illustrate and consider that as the ultimate harm in today's debate. But thirdly, we think that social media uh, um, is uh, oftentimes like co certain companies like Facebook and Twitters are starting to implement like certain censorship system. Like we agree that this is not perfect and there are pro potential problems with that because, but again, like what we're saying is that this is a transitional period. Like as we continue in improving like the censorship algorithm, we probably would achieve a uh, social media that is inclusive and beneficial for everyone, not yet. So but the, con the contrary, let's take a look at the issue of conventional media. Um, the Prime Minister said that conventional medias are better because they're sponsored and they are accountable to their sponsor. Now one, that is exactly bad because oftentimes these conventional Conventional media, like large media corporations, like media uh, news corp, are funded by large corp in global corporations. As a consequence of that, it's very difficult for journalists to challenge like bad activities conducted by these like large global corporations, like polluting pollution conducted by oil com companies. But second of all, journalists are also not like like specialists and perfect at all. Like. Oftentimes, journalists change their department. So at one time, you, you were uh, like a uh, journalist uh, covering uh, culture and sports, and the next year you are covering politics, right? So, we, so as a consequence of that, the speciality and the knowledge and skills of journalists is not as perfect as they assume. But thirdly, we think that media are also biased, right? Because journalists tend to be liberal, especially in the like, United States. They tend to live in places such as New York or California, right? Where people surrounding them are, tend to be liberal, and they, they tend to make uh, good money, and as a consequence of that, they misunderstand, they cannot understand the suffering of people living in the Rust Belt, right, of a, an average blue collar worker. So as a consequence of that, we don't think that, like, conventional media are perfect in covering those kind of areas. So let's move on to my final argumentation, which is the unique characteristic of social media that contributes to democracy, but before that, yes. Uh, we are not saying Brexit is bad, Trump is bad. We are saying the possibility that that decision was made based on wrong information is a critical issue. So critical. even if that is true, that's only a possibility of harm, right? It's not. So that possibility of harm is not a strong enough harm to consider social media as like ruining democracy. So my, moving to my final argumentation, which is the unique characteristic of social media that contributes to democracy. We think that the unique characteristic is of social media is engageability and mutual communication. So people are not just like a recipient of information, but they themselves are like journalists and participant of discourse. So people take photos of like black teenagers being beaten by white police officers, which initiated the whole discourse of police brutality in America and led to the Black Lives Matter movement, which would have been probably impossible if we, you only had a conventional media, because you won't be able to have these kind of discourse. Across the United States, right now, young teenagers are discussing about things such as gun control and gay rights across geographical locations, right? So that would be probably be impossible if you only had conventional media. The unique point of social media is, it's not just people are recipient of information, they can digest information and discuss information and they act upon it. So why, why do we think that this is important? It is important because it increases the political participation. Conventional, conventionally, people were apathetic about politics, even, if, even in democracies such as the United States, because they didn't feel or could visually recognize that, they are, that the, the one vote that they had had any political meaning or impact, especially like young, younger generation. But with the advent of social media, people are becoming more aware of the political power that they possess when they see like the Occupy Wall Street movement mobilized by social media impacting econ economical policy. So, um, uh, which achieves the very purpose of democracy, because democracy is not just about digesting like correct information. It's also about uh, it's, it's it's also about acting upon it, mobilizing upon it, and changing the society based on that particular information. And we believe that social uh, media strengthens the incentive and the motivation to act based on that information. So it's not just about disseminating correct information. It's about how people react and digest and act upon that information. And considering that, we believe that social media is a Essential. That is why we oppose. Thank you for the remark. Next, I'd like to follow up on government tweet to summarize this debate within seven minutes. Here, here. Can you hear me at the back? The 
the problem of opposition is that, you know, they're just saying, we can engage, we can voice out. But the question is, how do you do that? And is that important in democracy? Because you, the fact that you voice out and are able to kind of say what you want, it reaches some people. You have 1,000 likes, but does that reach anything? You're able to engage in your shitty Twitter dialogues and the 1,000 comments on Facebook or BBC's comment section. That seems like a dialogue, but is that productive? We sense that the dialogues and the discourse that are necessary in democracy are more sane and rational and calm and should be constructive. They have not, and it might be different, but they had to construct that. They have not shown what is important in democracy and how and what form their discussion or sort of voicing out is able to contribute to that. We told you the rather the opposite, that these shit talks in the media are garbage. We would not want to have that. That talks that are amplified, like we saw with Nigel Farage and Brexit, is the ultimate thing that are wasting our time that should be done in actual constructive and factual discussion. We know that CNN obviously tells lies too, but the likeliness of CNN telling lies is far less than the ability of these Nigel Farage or these individuals to refer to random statistics by random economists and say that their ideology is right. The individuals are not able to counter that and they are to be able to actually actualize, and we already saw that with Brexit, with Trump, with Five Star Movement, I'm um, sorry, anti-vaccination movement, and numerous other things going on in Europe and also in Japan. These realities do exist, and I'm not sure how they're able to counter that. Also with xenophobia, please deal with that. Two things I'm going to talk about. Firstly, how social media is beneficial. Secondly, and what is important in democracy. All rebuttals are integrated. So, Elo had a lot of examples in which they seemed like they were able to empower their case, but I don't think that's necessarily exclusive. First. Police brutality or Kavanaugh. Obviously, CNN was the kind of the first media to be able to actually criticize Kavanaugh on the front of it, obviously. I don't think necessarily that it was social media that was unique in it. Police brutality, the media, including CNN or BBC, were actually active in like, showing the images of police brutality and igniting people on the ground. I think the Baltimore prison crisis or the police crisis going on also would be something that was necessarily facilitated and triggered by the media and not necessarily show why social media was a critical part of it or something that was the unique trigger of the situation going on. I'm sure it contributed to it, but you have to touch why it was a necessary part because I was telling you that all the media, if it's able to contribute to that and facilitate that, we think that's sufficient and better show to ignite that discourse. The example on DLO gun control that's been there before social media existed. I'm not sure why young people being aware of the issue and vocalizing on, going on demonstrations uniquely after the post social media war. I deeply do not understand that and a lot of it's simple. People feel dissatisfied by the injustices going on and they are able to perceive that through searching on the internet by themselves or simply going on with looking at the media or these like CNN, Fox News, CBN or things like that and able to think what is right and go on advocating for themselves and I'm not sure why it's unique to the social media at their world. A bit on Tunisia, um, you know, that's just one example. Look at Libya, look at Syria, look at Egypt. It's not necessarily the case. And if the general argument about empowering demonstrations, well, look at China, they can block it. It's not necessarily that you're empowered in good ways on their side of the house. I think that's a fairly unsubstantiated case. So let's look at the, at the main case about how they give agencies on their side of the house. Ultimately, as, you, as I already said, you give that agency and your voice out, but it's very, really unclear how you reach that actual end. Look at the reality even in the status quo, that you reach the end by the facilitation and actual assistance of legitimate old media. It is not when minorities voice out themselves and suddenly random governments of, of US are able to reach them on the ground and create a critical mass on there. It's often the case that these grievances by minorities are picked up by a substantiated media like Al Jazeera and BBC because they are more credible, more reliable, and the investigative journalism that they are able to establish is more reliable, which means that the US government or people on the ground, actual organizations are able to lift up their, you know, oh my gosh, David, <laughs> lift up their, you know, old uh, resources and go into there. And obviously that's for the reason and, you know, that's not really exclusive. The problem is the ability for these media to do these investigative journalism and go into the corners of the dark side of society to actually point out on these issues are decreased because of social media. Because when the social media is a competitor of these old established media and their funding has the capability to continue to have quality investigative journalism, the higher quality journalism or simply invest in these risky, risky journalism, you know, they can't afford it because they lose the social media and their monetary resources are decreased on their side of the house. That's why if ultimately that these grievances are picked up by establishments, these establishments, if they decrease, they don't really actually change things, or it might be that they're rather decreasing the capability of change to happen. And I'm not sure why they're able to say that, you know, they say get to get, to get more help is not 
that good. Because ultimately, even on our side of without social media, these journalisms are able to highlight or identify these demonstrations that are going on, actually interview these people on the ground, and that's obviously that's, that's something that does not require social media. Um, the next thing I want to point out is that even if you have that agency, it's not like you can put it into practice. They never responded to a POI saying, you know, there are racists that are also able to use the social media and recognize it, say it's bigotries and lies and labels them as discriminatory force like social justice warriors, leftist tears and things like that. The reason why is that narrative of these racists are stronger than the minorities are because the regions that are problematic with my minorities are obviously more leaning to the major majority, which are these racists than these people, because these minorities are newcomers and the majorities are rather, these racists are more sympathizing because they're appealing to nationalism, ideologies and race that they already associate to. And it's easy for these racists to be able to identify some gaps and failures of the leftists or the minorities themselves, and easy to say that they are reliable, they are threat societies and things like that. That's why we would ultimately concede that the people outside of the country might sympathize, the people actually in the country who are most exposed and proximate to minorities will not sympathize to the people on the ground, the majority are more likely to be leaning to racists. That's why the conclusion of this scenario is ultimately that these people are exposed to more fear. That's why we see the rise of neo-Nazi movement. That's why we see more paintings of racist things on universities in America, actual riots by, or demonstrations by right-wing movement they're more increasing in our actual world in the, with the social media. I would say that the fear of people to be exposed to these kind of things are increased on their side of the house. The ability to, for people to practice and you know, safely opinionize themselves are decreased. And I think that ultimately, even if they engage, they engage in scattered ways because you know, the minority movement and the racist and the swing people that are kind of in, like brainwashed by or influenced by right-wing people, they're not really constructively doing it and why they don't achieve much of it. Then ultimately, even if we get them it, they haven't really talked about what is really important in democracy. We have told you, obviously, that for you to make a rational judgment, facts are important. When ideologies that reads Nigel Farage or other individuals are able to associate random facts with these ideologies that individuals are not able to counter it, your fundamental fabric of you to go on with the actual decisions are distorted. We regret Brexit. We regret Trump. But somehow we are in this world. Why do we not want why do we why don't we want to abolish social networks so we well, we, we were never in this world, thank you. Thank you, Primark. Next opposition whip to summarize this debate within seven minutes. Here, here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Speaker, their characterization in individual is that they have no capability, no media literacy to the extent that they can't properly examine information. If that radical characterization is true, we, can't, we have to abolish all information sources. We have to uh, prohibit individual from accessing any media sources or any info information sources, just even public opinion polls as well, right? So we have to reasonably assume that these individuals have some form of literacy, some hope of ability to consume information because they are using this kind of SNS every day in life at any moment. That is why it's illogical to assume that these people have no capability and ability as, uh, at all. If that logic is true, we can't give them any right to vote and any right to participate in democracy in the first place. And so that's the, that, that's the moderate characterization we would like to defend on our side of the house. Based on that, I'd like to answer three questions in this debate. One, how should, how should we deal with radicalism and extremism that they are worried about? Secondly, what's the impact over the quality of discourse? Number three, how should we deal with the false information or uh, full, uh, fake information? So moving on to the first issue, how should we, should we deal with the radicalism? And that's the main concern, and newly explained by the government with that like, radicals and extremists will take over and hijack the Twitter. That is good, because now the de de democratic society is now able to acknowledge the experiences and the political grievances that these extreme people embrace every day. And there's a reason why people become extreme and radical. For example, your job is stolen by immigrants, that e you are economically marginalized to the extent that you have to challenge a militarily challenge and fight against rich people, or you lose your family members in a warfare. There are reasons why people become radical and extreme. And now commercial media has historically been shutting down these people's discourse. And 
preventing all these individuals from expressing their ideologies. Now in our society, in a liberal democracy, now we are able to witness and hear the experiences and the grievances that these people confront every day. And that's the distinction here. And therefore, on comparison, if you respect informed judgment about our future in this country, it's far better that random individuals freely express radical ideology and we are able to point it out and criticize it openly. All right? Because otherwise, these radical people have no chances to realize that their thoughts are evil, their thoughts are wrong. Now they have opportunity and platform to testify their thoughts so that other people can counter prove that and counter argue that. If the one opinion is too illogical, such as let's kill all the Muslim people, just no one will listen to you, no one will give credit to your opinion. But if your extreme idea are to some extent uh, legitimate, for example, because charges are uh, justifying child abuse, we have to fight against them, we have to prosecute those individuals, we have to fight hard against priests. If that kind of defamation, if that kind of explicit idea come out, and there is a sort of outrage you know, that happens in the Twitter, and that is great experiences for democracy to acknowledge the reason why these people are extreme and what the reason why these people get radical opinion. And the other side of that, the extreme people is escalated and get become even more extreme and even more radical because no one listens to them. These people are socially disenfranchised and voices. How, how can you like make an informed decision under such voiceless democracy? And that's the consequence of this their, uh, proposal. Moving to the second clash about the impact over the quality of discourse. Uh, it's very difficult to measure the quality of discourse. The, 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 the metric is the amount and quantity of factually correct information. We challenge that per, uh, per, perception. Democracy is, is how we can structuralize inclusive discourse so that a wider, wider range of people take part in politics. And their example, their account analysis is that police brutality is anyway picked up by news media. No, there are more small but important and serious instances that individuals confront every day. Individuals are able to uh, share and express their personal uh, racism, like personal experiences of everyday racism that news media will never pick up. Right? Only like big incidents that news media think to be picky and uh, catchy are, are featured on the other side of us. No, we confront so many kinds of racism or uh, hatred hostility every day in our life, and that's the uniqueness of social media. This enables individuals to run, uh, express and vocalize these levels of grievances, small but important and serious occasion, and that's the uniqueness here. Secondly, they say they, you know, investigative journalism will decrease because the competitors will, are, uh, will emerge. That's a good thing, that that's opposite. When the competitors exist, they, there's all the more incentive for news media to improve the quality of journalism, because otherwise they cannot uh, get the uh, customers, they uh, share there are some resources. Therefore, BBC and CNN uh, uh, try to uh, make exertion all the more to improve their quality of uh, services, to quality of their uh, coverages. So the existence of competitor is actually good in terms of concerted market mechanism incentive. Finally, about, you know, we can't see the actual ends on our side of the house. Ladies and gentlemen, democracy is not about the political end. On both sides of us, it's impossible to achieve a perfect democracy. But we believe democracy is about process, how we structure the process of communication and the mutual engagement. And that's what democracy means on our side of the house. The, the leader of the opposition explained that the nature of the SNS is mutual engagement and also a rampant individual, the private individual, without any qualification, without any certificate, is able to take part in discourses. So we can't measure what kind of information is productive and helpful for our our future. The combination of many kinds of information constitutes great discussion and that can be measured by people and democracy, not the uh, artificial like, mechanism of news media agencies. Moving on to the final issues about how should we deal with false information. Go ahead. So do quarrels, do throwing slurs at each other, hating each other, which is the engagement you want to talk about, contribute to democracy? Yes, because one, because if it's literally meaningless, it's literally unproductive, that's not tweeted, that's not like expanded as the, and that, to the extent that causes outrage in a Twitter system. Uh, secondly, the people are able to not express why that shitty activity is actually shit, and that's a great opportunity which has no, uh, like, which is not acquirable and accessible on the, their side of the house under the conventional media model. So their main concern is about false information, there are three responses. One, what's the definition of a truth in the first place? Yeah, yeah. Truth is not about black and white. There are some gravity and some ambiguity in there. That no, uh, like you know, for example, when you uh, express your opinion or insights and idea, that's not publicly verifiable. That's not evidentially provable. But still, you have every single right to express that. And it's very important that people confront such kind of ideas. So if they are, uh, if they believe prerequisite for democracy is to show that your idea is always verified and. Uh, Approved, then you are creating very strong hurdle for people to enter democracy in the first place. So that perception narrative is very dangerous. 
Secondly, if you are talking about literally false data or evidence or statistics, like when the random anonymous, anonymous people tweet such a number, no one believes in that. So the context is maybe public figures, politicians, professors, but those are the kind of people who cite evidence, quote evidences. These people have a strong incentive not to undermine their reputation. They will have strong incentive to gain popularity, to make sure that information is credible. So if the context is true, I don't think that's problematic. Finally, even conventional media is very biased. Like a left-wing newspaper, like uh, Asahi newspaper, uh, uh, picked a wrong article about comfort women based on wrong distorted number, and that's more likely to happen under the editorials are not professional and even politically ideologically biased, sponsored by corporation and a big industry. We are happy to oppose. Thank you. Thank you for your mark. Opposition reply to summarize this debate. Here, here. Two things to talk about. First, let's talk about the meta of the debate because, like, let's look back at the motion again and see whether or not government was really doing the motion. Secondly, let's talk about the end goal of that side of the house because they wanted to talk about truth, but at the same time, they failed to talk about why that was necessary in a democracy. First, let's talk about the meta of the debate, right? Like, honestly, the debate is asking us to talk about whether social network services is ruining democracy. It's not talking about whether it can possibly ruin democracy, right? Because most of the cases that that side of the house was talking about was the possibility of social network medias being abused, right? So they're talking about a one-side view of the end of the like how you can use it as a spectrum and how that one side of it is actually contributing to democracy potentially in a bad way that might happen in like one out of like 10 or 100 or all those kind of things, right? I do not think that that is enough for you to be able to affirm the motion precisely because of the fact that it's asking for an absolute. They literally need to give you an absolute reason as to why social network services in the plethora of cases that we've all talked about in today's debate was always going to be bad and always ruining democracy. At that point, we literally heard nothing coming from that side of the house. Like literally, the only analysis that was coming from that side of the house was you have shitty people and because shitty people are using social, social network services and they're doing shit talks on social network services, those are all bad things, right? Um, newsflash, they can also use things like television, they can also use things like books, they can also use things like, I don't know, journalism, they can also be journalists, they can also be like teachers, presidents, all those kind of things. So there are many circumstances that we have in status quo, but we don't really claim them as things that ruin democracy, right? Because those things can also be potentially used to enhance democracy. And at the end of the day, what we were talking about was the potential and the mechanism of how social network services can contribute to that. The information asymmetry, the ability of individuals to be able to voice out their concerns. When minority these are like censored from political spheres and being able to have access to things like, for example, university campuses, being able to talk about their concerns, and being able to be represented within their, their own countries. So social network services, social, social network services exist for, for those people, right? What was their engagement? They literally had no counterfactual to that extent. They, did, they literally didn't say how without the existence of social network services, those individuals will also be fine. We do not think to that extent they're going to be winning this debate. Next, let's talk about truth, right? This is me being generous to them because they wanted to talk about truth. Um, three questions. First, um, what is truth? Like, seriously, I'm very curious. What is truth? Right? Like, no explanation, number one. Secondly, um, if you think about it, isn't truth something that convinces you? So it's also about information sy uh, information symmetry, right? Like, the fact that you're able to get a ton of information about something and you're able to convince yourself that this very specific phenomenon is something that's truthful and something that you should pursue in every in every aspect of your, mo your morality is something that you usually define as something that's true, right? So their main concern can be solved even under our side of, uh, under our side of the house when you provide individual an access to having like a plethora of information for them to be able to make up the value judgment of whether or not something is true. So to that extent, as we say, is that even under, under our side of the house, if you're talking about the quality of individuals being able to achieve their own truth, we can get that under our side of the house, so we don't really see how that's mutually exclusive. Secondly, um, it's the truth that they're really wanting to talk about inelastic, right? Because most of their analysis were saying that this thing is wrong, because it's wrong, it's bad. Like, talking about the Brexit charts that were... Um, like published before. First thing we say is that it changes every day, right? So basically, if it changes every day, it's elastic. When something is elastic, you need individuals to be able to catch up to that. How are you going to catch up to that under your side of the house when you don't have social network services, when people can literally update things and information on like the time it's actually being updated, right? So obviously in that aspect, our side of the house is much more better. But even if, fine, even if they get truth, and the kind of truth that they're wanting to assert, which we still don't know at the end of the day, um, why was that important or necessary to democracy at the end of the day? Like literally, people vote for things like, for example, like non-real things. Like for example, I can vote for a politician because I believe in Christianity. And at the end of the day, we all know that Christianity is, well, 
probably, or might not be real, or might not be true. Like, we don't know, we can't confirm the existence of God, right? So we don't know whether or not it's true or false. But at the end of the day, we don't ban people from being able to vote on their religious beliefs. That means, even if we take in the best case scenario of that side of the house, the value that they were trying to fight for at the end of this debate was not necessary for democracy. Therefore, the lack of that doesn't become a reason for social network services to ruin democracy at the end of the day. So in even if case, even if they still get that, that doesn't become a reason for you not to vote for opposition. Thank you for the remark. Finally, I'd like to call upon government reply to conclude this debate within four minutes. Here, here. It was really interesting. Mitsu-san said, Mitsu-san doesn't tweet anything meaningless, right? I don't think it's the case. At least in my case, I tweet meaning, meaningless things. I'm tired, uh, it's, yeah, something is never uh, meaningful. This is still acceptable, but worst case, that information is mani maliciously manipulated and fabricated. They need to prove why it's still meaningful and why it's contributing to make better democracy. We told you it's already bad because the decision made on wrong information is not uh, not for democracy. The possibility is that the election, the result of the election, um, might be different. It might be the same. That's the possibility. But it's the fact that that decision was made on wrong information, and that fact itself is denying that what the function of democracy. That's why I'm still very proud to propose the motion. So let's look at the opposition's case. The most friendly way to take the argument is that social media is sometimes a good, to, sometimes a good opportunity to promote the minority light or accelerate the spotlighted issues. Yeah, that's true. There are some case studies, maybe, to support their case. Black Lives Matter, maybe that's the case. But the thing is, social media also empowers people who are interested in policing people they want to protect. This is logically proven by our side of the house and also empirically proven by our side of the house. This is posting social media that, not, that you gain more likes sometimes than post by minority movement. That's also that's true. So the thing is, it's also the possibility. Sometimes SNS is working well, or sometimes SNS is working very harmful way for minority that they want to protect. So. Yeah, the thing is, um, that's also one possibility from our opposition bench. Then let's look at the value judgment from our side of the house. We told you, as I told you already in the reply speech, the fact that the decision is based on the wrong information is critically harmful for democracy. We told you that making people informed of the fact what is going on in the world is a core function of democracy in order to make the rational judgment for individuals. We told you already from Prime Minister, if it's, or it may be important to express your opinions in SNS and uh, maybe communicate with um, the different London people. Maybe it's important, but we told you if that expression is based on wrong information, that expression cannot be meaningful and that cannot con uh, constitute to the better democracy in, our, in our, their side of the house. They never justify their case by the solid principle why even though it's meaningless, even though it's fabricated, even though it's manipulated, that communication is still meaningful to make, it, uh, make, uh, make democracy better. Um, they, and let's touch a little bit about the claim coming from our opposition base because they said it's unrealistic to assume citizens don't have any major literacy to judge the uh, information. That's why our harm doesn't stand. We didn't say that. We told you the possibility that information in social media is actually not true is more more higher than the possibility that the old media's information is factually uh, factually not true. So in that case, in, we are assuming the same maybe same liter literacy in either, either side of the house. Then citizens have same literacy for the information. We say if the old media has more possibility to go out to broadcast the true information, we think it will be better democracy. We, we, I want to clarify, our burden is not to prove like the democracy is completely functioning in our side of the house with the old media. We already admitted social media, I'm, I'm sorry, old media has some um, bad things, maybe some information was wrong, that's true. But we told you the possibility or likelihood that old, um, the social media is broadcasting the wrong information is much higher because there are no accountability required for the individual that is posting random information in SNS. 
So in short, we told you the principle why democracy should be based on the true information and the possibility to broadcast true information is higher in the outside of the house. That's why we're proposed.